Grace Bible Church, welcome to another episode of Living by the Book. Pastor Rick, good to see you as always, thank sir. Thank you. Good morning. Hey, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm grateful that you follow your calendar because I feel like I can just put things on it. Yeah. And then you show up. It's amazing. It's yeah. like a superpower. <laughs> yeah, that or I'm an uh, autonomon or whatever they call it. Yeah. So you're like AI, I think. Yeah. That's the closest. Uh, you know every you know every word in the English language. Certainly artificial. Sometimes you create new words and they become a part of the English it's language. It's not true. It's not true. <laughs> no, I appreciate you being here. Uh, my question for you today is a very practical one. And the reason I'm asking is because we've had a number of weddings in the past few weeks. Hmm. It's kind of been wedding season, it feels like. And a few students that went through the youth group when I was there have gotten married. And uh, even You're getting other, old, man. I know. I, I, I feel that way. I feel it. My body hurts. It's all the things. <laughs> my mid thirties. It's really sad, but that's not what I want to ask you about. Uh, what I did want to ask is on behalf of these, these young married couples and, you know, people like myself who are still hopefully early into our marital career. Uh, if you could give one piece of advice and I know I'm saying one and I may end up getting three, but I'll take whatever you give me. Uh, what would be your number one tip for maintaining a healthy marriage over the long run? Well, I, I think it's very clear. Um, what is the most important thing? And that is your relationship with God. That can sound trivial or trite or, yeah, okay, well, give us something that's actually practical. And But it is. It is the most important thing. It is the thing that without which your marriage can only go so far. It's governed. Um, and, excuse me, <clears throat> it's governed. And um, the only way that governor on your the quality of your marriage is able to be lifted is for God to lift it. And the way that he does that is through your relationship with him. Um, I would go, uh, uh, and maybe this isn't where people go to apply the issues to marriage, but I would encourage you to look at John 13. Uh, this is Jesus speaking. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Obviously, loving one another is critical yeah. in marriage. It seems to stand out in that. Yeah, that yeah. It's kind, of, it's kind of necessary that you love one another. But the only way you're going to love one another with a depth and richness that is a, is possible is if you have that love um, with God through Jesus Christ. The, the, the first and foremost uh, tip in having a um, loving marriage, a marriage that lasts, a marriage that's blessed and in, in, in enriching, is to pursue a dynamic love for God. Um, in this passage, it says, even as I have loved you, love one another. You're not able to love one another without the experience of mm. the way Christ has loved us. So if you marginalize Christ, if you neglect the pursuit of your relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're not in the word, if you're not praying, if you're not worshiping, uh, if you're not fellowshipping with other believers and really allowing the spirit of God to provide to prevail in the formulation of your reciprocal love for Christ, even as John tells us in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. Mm -hmm. So if you're not responding to that love that Christ has for you, there's going to be a governor on how well you're able to love your mm -hmm. spouse. Um, that's borne out again in Ephesians 5. And before you jump there, can I? do you <clears throat> find that... Uh, this is an area of struggle for young couples. Do you find that when they, you know, when they, when they leave the the single life where they all their time is their own and they can kind of organize it the way they want and they they come together, do you find that there's a a, a struggle where that that uh, spiritual life takes a step back in a sense? Is that something that you've seen over over the course? Not of Not necessarily. Years? I think that that there are couples that are very diligent from mm -hmm. the very beginning and they seem to get it okay. that their spiritual life is going to profoundly impact their marital life. Mm -hmm. And so they pursue that. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately there are times, not just in young couples, but older couples as well, where they um, become um, unaware of or negligent of the cause and effect dynamic of your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. 
through Christ. Not just in your own personal blessing and, and so on, but in terms of your, your relationship and your ability to relate to your spouse, um, we need to be mentored in loving someone other than ourselves. We don't know how innately to love anyone except ourselves. And therefore, breaking out of a self-love to prefer someone else, we have to be taught how to do that. And what more profound lesson are we able to find anywhere than Jesus' self-denial for our sakes? He did not love himself. He loved us. He made himself of no reputation. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He laid down his life for us, which the scripture says, greater love is no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus demonstrated how to, how to not love yourself first, but to love others, which is what is needed in marriage. Yeah. You know, yeah. your spouse has to become the one that you love even above yourself. And the mentoring for that and the, and the way to do that is found in experiencing the love of God for you. That's where he says, even as I have loved you, love one another. So I think couples become uh, negligent of that cause and effect. They, they, they forget or maybe never have discovered or considered the fact that their spiritual walk and their relationship with Jesus Christ is a foundation upon which their love for one another springs or rests, if you're using a foundation, right? It rests on that love that Christ has for you and experiencing that. If you don't know anything about the love of God, if you're not f cultivating and fertilizing in your own heart through the Spirit's work and by the grace of God and through the agency of the scriptures and other things, if you're, if you're not enriched by your relationship with Jesus Christ, then the likelihood is your self-love will grow. And that keeps you from being able to love your spouse the way that is necessary for a healthy marriage, right? Um, that passage in Ephesians 5, I think that's important as well in verses 1 and 2. Um, again, there's a comparison of the way we love one another with the way that we have been loved by God. And I think this is a mentoring kind of a scenario in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How do I learn how to give myself up, my preferences, my desires? How do I learn how to put my spouse first above my own need, mm -hmm. except by looking at what Jesus has done? So even as... Christ has loved you, walk in love, mm. right? So I, again, you asked me the key to a happy, successful, blessed marriage. And it is for each person in the marriage to pursue the relationship with God through Jesus Christ, knowing the love of Christ. And if your spouse isn't interested in doing that, you doing it yourself, mm is going to enable you to have joy in preferring your spouse, even when they are not doing or behaving the way they should. You, Because is that not how Jesus loved us? The scripture yeah. says that while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. God demonstrated his yeah. love toward us, right? And Christ died for us. That's the act of love that mm -hmm. laid down his life for his friends. So he has taught us to love even the unlovely, so it's not just loving the lovely, loving the person who loves you back, loving it. No, as Christ has loved us means before we are even loved or the person who is the object of our love is ever worthy of it. We love them. And I think that's key. Flip back to John 15 and look at verses 12 and 13. And it advances this a little further. Um, I think... Yeah, John 15, verse 12, uh, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. 
Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. So that's the standard. Yeah. God sets the standard way, right, way up here. And yeah. we understand we cannot do that without grace. Mm. Lay down, you know, he says, love one another just as, not similar to or approximate or in a token reflection, mm. but just as I have loved you, love one another. And then he sets the standard. Greater love than a man lay down his life. Hmm. Husbands need to lay down their lives for their spouses. The rest of Ephesians 5 talks about that, right? How that husbands are to love their wives, even as Christ right. loved the church, right. gave himself up for her. That's the way husbands are to love their wives. And wives are to love their husbands and respect them and um, to love and appreciate their leadership and headship and so on. That is only going to be able to be done as we experience that love that Christ has for us. And I think um, the final demonstration of the love that Christ has for us that I'll mention here is in Philippians 2. If you want to flip over there, that obviously is is, uh, critical. And he, he gives us the command, and then he describes the standard, right? So he gives us the command... He says, um, do, in verse 3, mm-hmm. do nothing from selfishness nor empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And so the idea of preferring another, making their needs more important than your needs, prioritizing them over yourself is done through Christ and through the example of Christ. And then the rest of it talks about have this attitude in yourselves, which right. is also in Christ. And then it goes through the, the, the consummate example of Christ's self-sacrifice, mm-hmm. his humility, which it says here, uh, but with humility of mind, verse three, regard one another as more important than yourselves, humility um, is is inherent in that loving someone else. Because in order to love someone else, you have to put yourself second, which is an act of humility. And um, a lot of couples, they don't have humility. They have pride. And they elevate themselves. And their their own interests are the things that are important. Their own desires, their own preferences are the things that are important. And what the spouse needs or wants is like irrelevant. Mm-hmm. As long it's it's about right. me. It's right. about me. Uh, you're not treating me with respect. You're not valuing me. You're not yeah. loving me. You're taking advantage of me. You're not you know affirming me. You're not talking to me. You're not you know all these things that are so oriented to mm-hmm. m- myself. And what the scripture says is the way to have a happy marriage. Um, is by learning how to love one another and to love one another well. And the way you do that is through the experience of being loved by Christ. Because we can't love even as Christ loved us unless we are aware of how Christ loved us. And becoming more aware of how Christ loved us as time Mm -hmm. goes. And that then gives you the ability, uh, I was talking to somebody just earlier today that was talking about in marriage, one of the things that is necessary is that every day, every encounter, every exchange, every moment, you make choices. You make a choice to be humble. You make a choice to prefer them. You make a choice to not be offended. You make a choice to um, sacrifice for them. Or you make a choice to put yourself first. You make a choice to be offended. You make a choice to... Uh, demand of them that they consider you. Uh, you know, you're making choices all the time. Choices become intuitive on the basis of what you are, who you are inside, right? So you choose consistently with your nature. What's dominant in your nature is what drives your choices. We don't have the freedom to choose contrary to our nature. Um, we're, that's our free will is somewhat limited by our nature, right. even as right. God's free will is limited by his nature, right. right? So God can't lie. He can't, he can't renege on his word. He can't um, violate any of his perfections. He's bound by his nature right. 
to make choices consistent with that. He can't make a choice inconsistent with his nature. Neither can we. The new nature that we've been given in Christ Jesus when we became new creatures through knowing and experiencing his love changed our nature, yet we fight our flesh. So if our flesh is resurgent and dominant, the nature is going to drive choices consistent with that. And that's going to be selfish. But as we are knowing the love of Christ, as we are cultivating that heart for God in Christ Jesus, and we're being conformed to the image of Christ, the choices that are going to flow out of that are going to be loving choices, where we choose to love someone more than ourselves, where we regard another Mm -hmm. as better than ourselves or more important than ourselves. And that comes from Christ and his example. So the most important thing in marriage is spiritual vitality that Mm -hmm. comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yeah. It's not impractical. If somebody says, no, we want something practical. Right. There is nothing more practical than that. That is the base off which all of it flows. Yeah. And I can't advocate for that as a priority in a couple yeah. more. No, I, I find that very helpful because, you know, it's interesting. You uh, you didn't take us to any marriage passages. Mm-hmm. Essentially, what you're saying is if you're, if you're doing what any Christian should do, right. you should be able to have a healthy marriage. Right. Because all those passages are, are just given to believers, right? They're just, right? Those are just general commands that we're all called, some of them given in the context of the church in particular. Mm. Uh, so I, I find it very helpful because in many ways it's it's just like look just just obey the the commands that God has given you pursue Christ like any Christian should and that's the key to a healthy marriage you don't have to do anything in addition to all that it's just be be a faithful Christian uh, so I find that very helpful because I do think it it helps people realize look if you if you'll just commit yourself to this there's there's not this other like special magical formula you have to solve to have a healthy marriage it will it will become that as both of you are growing in Christ, both as individuals and together. So I, I think it's a very helpful uh, and very, very sage wisdom for for young people. So we appreciate yeah. that. You, yeah. you bet. Yeah. Well, church, we hope that this has helped you. And uh, for those of you, whether you're, whether you are married or you are anticipating marriage or hoping to be married, uh, again, this is a principle that that is necessary for every single one of us who would claim to follow Christ. And so we pray that this has encouraged you and that it, it reinvigorates you to, to pursue him as you spend time in his word this week. So church, we love you. And we'll see you next time on another episode of Living by the Book. Take care.